Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass PNC. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. It's wonderful to be talking to you for an extended period of time today. We're recording two episodes. Right now, we're going to be talking about banks. We talked about a bank in the last episode, uh, Dell Tech. Uh, and this episode, we're going to be talking about regional banks in America. Um, we're going to revisit the banking crisis from last year. I, I think we should go over it a bit. I, you know, it has been a, a, a year since we had Rohan Gray on to, to talk about it. If you are interested in that discussion, which I think was valuable and insightful when it comes to moral hazards, insurance, all of this stuff, give it a listen. If not, you know, we're going to just quickly go over some of the, the talking points that we had in that. But I also want to discuss, I know we're no banking experts, but I, I do want to see what our opinion is as to the lessons learned and the takeaways that were made and whether the future for community banks, regional banks, and larger banks, too big to fail banks, I suppose, uh, looks bright or looks bleak. Where do you want to start, Bennett? Because there's a lot of places we can start here. I think one of the most interesting places to start with this is, as you mentioned, the bank in trouble right now is New York Community Bank Corp, which merged with Flagstar. And what makes them interesting is they were struggling quite severely. They got a billion dollar investment led by one of my least favorite people on earth, Stephen Mnuchin, <laughs> today, which should hopefully allow them to continue operating. Hopefully it allows them to continue operating in a way where Steven still loses all of his money. That's my goal for this investment. <laughs> I, um, I doubt it. But what's, <laughs> what's interesting about it is that uh, Flagstar was the entity which acquired a lot of the signature bank assets after their difficulties. And so that's the crypto connection that initially jumps out at me, is that we saw Signature Bank became Signature Bridge Bank after its failure, as is typical. Those assets were then acquired by Flagstar as Flagstar was merging into New York Community Bank Corp. And now we've had kind of this chain of failures chase this set of assets up the chain, right? Uh, Silvergate fails, which puts more pressure on Signature, eventually causing Signature to fail. So Signature's assets get bought by Flagstar, which eventually, after it merges with New York Community Bank Corp, ends up in this situation where they need a billion dollar, let's call it a lifeline. And it's kind of funny, at least to me, that it's that same in part set of assets that have been passed along that chain the entire way. I, I just imagine being one of these customers and how infuriating it would be. Like imagine having, this is what I said to, to Bennett before, imagine having $300,000, you know, having over the insured amount in a bank account at Signature Bank, and then they fail and the FDIC swoops in and you're thinking like, oh no, I lost like $50,000, like a significant sum of money if that's my all the money that I have. And then the FDIC eventually assures you like, no, don't worry, we're giving everybody their money. Like, it's going to be fine. And also this this other bank is moving in to swoop up assets. Everyone's getting everything. Uh, so you, you kind of let out a, a sigh of relief. You think, OK, good. My three hundred thousand dollars is safe again. Maybe you didn't learn the lesson because of this to not just get a sweep account or have more than one bank or, you know, or get insurance on the secondary market. Like we should be explicit. If you're if you're a rich person and you have uninsured deposits, you can go to like insurers and buy insurance. Sure. So so there's multiple ways to go about this. There's a lot of different things you can do to alleviate these these risks and these issues if you have over $250,000 in an account. But imagine being someone who didn't learn that lesson from that first failure and now you're having to deal with that stress again of like, "Oh no. Is my bank going to fail?" And just to be that person to see the two banks you're banking with fail within a year of each other, pretty much, right? So it's not a failure, but to me, it might as well be. If you need a single individual to come give you a lifeline, to me, that means your bank has, well, and, has ultimately failed. Um, we, we, we should be clear. It's not just Steven. His firm is bringing about half the total with $450 million, but it's filled out with, with a bunch of other that's firms. That's still horrendous, like right? Citadel and Reverence and whatever. Yeah. No, listen. Any situation where you start to feel like Steven Mnuchin might be like your hero, might be the solution yeah. to Citadel? your problem instead of a problem, Citadel? you're in deep shit. Yeah. If you're relying on Citadel as your hero, you are definitely in trouble. What I'm saying is more to the effect of like, you're kind of teaching a really horrible lesson to any distracted investor, to anybody, not even an investor, just somebody 
th and this is going to get to a bigger point that maybe we'll make a little bit later. But to me, most of what these banks are supposed to be providing, I understand the mechanisms they engage in now. And a lot of it is speculative nonsense. But largely what they're supposed to be doing is providing a public good. They're supposed to be giving people access to access to a place to store their wealth, access to vehicles that could earn them conservative amounts of interest um, or higher, more speculative amounts of interest if that is what they're seeking. But overall, the goal is to bring a community in, bring a bunch of individuals together and work with them and provide them something that is very important everywhere in this country, everywhere in the world. And it is a public good. And so I like I reflect on that and I just think they're really not performing their duty and the lessons being taught to these people who are using these banks aren't good lessons. Like if you're if you should only have $250,000 in these accounts, then we need people to be responsibly behaving with their money in different ways than just throwing it all into one single account. And that is not the lesson being taught when Signature fails and you say, never mind, when Silicon Valley Bank fails and you say, never mind, when when these banks fail and you say, don't worry about that legal limit that we said was necessary. But then you continue to pretend that 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 is the enforceable legal limit. I have no idea what lesson you're even teaching other than you're lying. I think we got into this really well in our episode with Rohan, actually, where we talked about how banking is this extraordinarily unique industry, right? It is the only industry in the United States that's allowed to take deposits of people's money, right? Lots of other places can extend loans and do the rest of like the banking business. But the taking of the deposits is a uniquely bank activity. And like that has this like strange effect on the way we treat banking, both in like how we set up the FDIC and how we deal with the insurance, how the Federal Reserve provides liquidity, but also like the strange crossroads you or crossheads you end up with in some moments in the banking industry. And we you see this in the great financial crisis, right? And the movements afterwards, where it is reasonably straightforward to make an argument that the bailouts after the great financial crisis did more good than harm by preventing knock-on financial consequences due to the failures of some of these institutions. However, that still leaves us at where we were when we were talking with Rohan. If you're in a situation where the state, where the taxpayer funds are being effectively extended as this de facto guarantee that these firms, these institutions need to continue existing and will continue existing, and the state is willing to step in to ensure they continue to exist, then it is only reasonable that there are additional expectations placed on those firms and those institutions because they are, they are filling that role. And so when we had Rohan on, one solution we talked about was like this restructuring of banking where you change how the deposits are held so that you're able to offer the that full insurance. And when banks fail, like they just fail and get wiped off and the deposits are still insured. And you don't actually need to worry about the people, the bank, the equities, whatever, that can all end up worthless without harming the individuals. But, and you were getting at this before we were got before we got on, you were, I think, frustrated with the way the expectations of the stock market and the fiduciary duty executives are meant to hold till shareholders often seems at odds with responsibly managing a bank. I broaden this because to me, it's important that I mention other things in, in this sense, because I do think that banking is a public good. I do think that things like electricity, water, like things that are going to, you know, even like I, I, I guess I understand more with something like pharma, right? Like as much as I might not like far, like pharmaceuticals, I understand needing to profit to put the, not that they all do this, but profit so that you put a lot of that money back into doing research and development so that you can help, help people that way. Like, are banks doing that, right, with their profits? Are they putting the money back into finance to change it so that it's better for everyone? Are electricity companies putting a ton of money into R&D instead of maintaining the lines and making sure that there's not giant wildfires in California. Like, 
no, I don't think they are. I don't think that's where those profits actually are going. And if those aren't where the pro if the profits aren't going into fixing the system, if it's broken, then what are you? Why are you profiteering? Why is this something that needs to be traded in in a public market, like on the New York Stock Exchange? Why does it need to be traded on the Nasdaq? Like it's crazy to me that we simultaneously expect these banks to be protecting customers and building communities and helping helping people fiduciary duty you mentioned that right fiduciary duty these people have a duty to you to protect your money but they also have a duty to their shareholders this this like how can you possibly make those two ends meet and i don't think you actually can and that's where i go like what what are we doing and have we have we learned anything in the past year we you know you you and i were talking before and i was saying this regional banking crisis just essentially just never ended and like if this bailout if this buy-in for for investing in in flagstar this is not the end of this and you were like well maybe it is and i'm like in what sense in what sense do we not see this happen again because all it takes we've seen how little it takes it's it takes this there's a bank run which as you've said there's ways to actually protect customer deposits in situations like that and then there's things where it's like it's already outside the scope of a bank run when now we're talking about the stock price just plummeting whether or not the assets are there whether or not like they're not toxic assets like um i had an argument with with another friend of the show back when silicon valley bank was already toast and first republic was looking really bad i loved i loved first republic they like my mom had banked with them she always had talked about how great they were and i saw what was happening to them and i said it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if the customers love them it doesn't matter what the banking experience has been forever First Republic is going to get crushed now because it is just a symptom of this disease. And this person was like, no, that, like their their book is better. Their assets are better. They don't have the same issues that Silicon Valley Bank has. And I said, it doesn't fucking matter. And I hate to say this because they should have been right. They should be right. If the book is better and the assets are better, the, the efficient market would say that they're right and I'm wrong. And yet, First Republic was dead like a week later. I think that the point you're making there is really interesting because there is this potentially really strange feedback loop where the struggling stock price, the struggling equity value of like the equity value of the bank, even if the assets and liabilities are seemingly okay, solvent, whatever, you can end up at a point where because people start pulling their deposits in reaction to fear from the stock price, declining equity, things like that, causes the bank to go from safe to unsafe because of this drop in the stock price that might be unrelated to the actual like assets over liability of the bank. And that is a problematic tension. And I think that we were really trying to get at this when we had Rohan on. And it's one of the things that frustrates me a bit with the banking system is because that's bad. Pe people should not be expected to assess their bank's solvency before they deposit money. That's not a reasonable expectation, apparently, even for top flight venture capitalists, <laughs> right? So now that we've established that no one can do that, even investors, <laughs> apparently not even bank executives. Even even the top minds of a generation, apparently. <laughs> That's not reasonable. The solution to me ends up feeling like if you want to have investment banking, banks doing lending, things like that, you need to somewhat disconnect those activities from risk to depositors. We talked about that with Rohan is by basically restructuring it so that they have to hold certain assets to cover those with certain insurance to cover it and changes in how the FDIC is capitalized to manage that. I think that gets part way there. The other solution I'm a big fan of is things like postal banking, right? When you are, when the state actually directly offers a lot of these services to people, you kind of put a floor on how bad other banks can be because there's this like easy, broadly available alternative, right? If you're worse than the postal banking, you won't get enough deposits. And without changes to the banking structure, you can't do all your risky shit unless you're convincing people to put deposits in. You're somewhat limited, right? There's structural limits on how much you can do and stuff like that. And so like there are 
partial solutions there, but it does feel like, especially post great financial crisis, we've created a system that makes it so you can't prosecute these big entities because the knock-on risks of that risk financial damage to many, right? Lenny Brewer said that when he was Obama's head of DOJ. When we considered these prosecutions, he said he did the right thing in not going after any of these people because the consequences would have been better than any benefit that would have been brought by those prosecutions. And regulators down the line generally seem to agree with that. The Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC very much prefer a consent order to not getting the consent order. Right? They want you to agree, sign off, and say you're going to make these changes and all these things. And so because of that, there is this kind of, as long as you're not too bad for too long, too blatantly, you'll kind of skirt on by. Yeah, too big to prosecute, which is kind of mm -hmm. crazy. I guess it's exactly what you're talking about. If these people are saying we can't prosecute people for for white collar crimes at banks because basically if we do that there's going to be bank runs and then all the banks are going to have bank runs and then everybody's screwed well then that points to a broken system to me and that isn't just a person saying i didn't go after them let's move on that's actually someone saying i didn't go after them the system's broken we need to fix it and that if and we have not done that, I guess, is what I'm whether we're talking about prosecuting people for crimes or we're talking about simpler things like ensuring that depositors don't get hurt when a bank fails. Right. These very, very important things have been completely not addressed. And that that's after Silicon Valley Bank, which was one of the bigger regional banks in America, had this insane collapse occur. And the knock on effects were very real because it was First Republic. It was Pac, Pac West. It was like there was a bunch of these. It was Signature. It was a bunch of banks, actually. Big, big regional banks that got screwed. And now a year later, we're still dealing with the ramifications of this. And no, no process has changed. Nothing about the system has changed. Even when the FDIC had to go in and say, never mind, forget the insurance limits. Even when you had uh, regulators essentially shitting themselves. You had the Fed freaking out. You had everyone scared in this moment. But then we move on like nothing happened. You actually probably remember better than I do because you were older than I was when it was happening. But Arthur Anderson, their prosecution. We've talked about Arthur Anderson on here before for their role in World Common Enron. But their PR push after the prosecution when they were working on appealing eventually all the way up to the Supreme Court and getting a lot of it reversed. Their PR push was, this is a firm of 26,000 innocent people, right? You can't go after us. You can't do that because most of these people didn't do anything and you wouldn't want to hurt them. And that sentiment has become deeply embedded in a lot of like the regulatory state and things like that, where that is a serious consideration made by SEC, CFTC, OCC, and DOJ uh, individuals before they bring a case. And even recently in cryptocurrency, I was struck by uh, some of Christopher Blodgett's comments in a deposition related to the SEC case against Binance US, where he was kind of complaining that the SEC suit against Binance US was a near mortal blow that led to them needing to lay off 200 people and all these things and basic and that they lost 15 out of their 20 market makers and all these banks cut them off and all this and the kind of insinuation seems to be that like the SEC caused all this damage destroyed our thing and have yet to even prove their case right and like that tendency for firms to so heavily emphasize the cost of any kind of regulation, oversight, anything, seems deeply embedded in a lot of our corporate and regulatory culture. And I don't really have a good feeling on how to solve it. Well, I mean, it's funny to me that, you know, it didn't work for Arthur Anderson, right? I mean, it kind of did, though. They never went bankrupt. Yeah, all their assets just got bought. Um, yeah, fair enough. And, I, and they lost their accounting license, right? And Accenture still exists. Right, and like, right. if you read uh, the stories of people working there, the consulting side had a ton of huge conflict of interest issues and stuff like that right. that were never addressed. I don't know either, but I will say that, like, I guess this this even gets into like Trump stuff with him where the Supreme Court sidestepped the, the actual issue. And the Supreme Court sidestepped the issue in Arthur Anderson, too. 
I don't know if you remember that, is when it came up to them, it the uh, the reason the charges got dismissed was because of the way the judge instructed the jury. And they found issue with specific jury instructions and how broad they were. And that was enough to basically overturn the conviction. Yeah. And then the government wasn't going to go for a retrial because Arthur Anderson's partners had put so much money into this like broad PR thing that had gone like all the way up into like a blue dobs was really pushing it and stuff at that point that it had started to reshape the narrative around those type of things. My point here being the, qu- the question for a lot of these things becomes for Trump, it would be something like, is he allowed to break any law because of presidential immunity for a large company for a, a bank or a bank for that matter with millions of customers, let's say, are they immune? You know, do they not need to be transparent because actual transparency will hurt people more? And and I'll tell you, I know that you and me have the same feelings about this, right? You and me know that to us, the answer is that's insane. That's insane. Like, yeah, I'm sorry. If every bank is doing something atrocious, the answer isn't, okay, well, let's just hide it for a while and fix it. It's Expose this to sunlight and let's work on a solution. If every cryptocurrency exchange is front running their customers or something, these are all hypotheticals. Yeah, it's not all of them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. If these things were happening, I want them to be exposed and I want the people in charge of it to be properly punished. And yeah, do I expect the public to be concerned? Do I expect them to maybe close accounts at certain places that are consistently awful in how they treat their customers or how they've screwed their customers over. It's always shocking to me that Wells Fargo is still publicly traded even. Like, that's crazy. But whatever, right? Like, something needs to change. And I think the part that is disheartening to me, you never expect things to change. Certainly not for the good as you get older and older and more conservative and lame like me. You hope still. And when I see crises like this happen, And then I feel like the lesson learned, again, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, these aren't small banks. They weren't small. They were big. And to see them fail so quickly and to just, like, I feel like everyone's forgotten about it. Like, no one talks about it. There's no congressional hearings about Silicon Valley Bank anymore. There's no, like, no, no congressman is making, I mean, that should still be the main issue for a congressman in my in in California, we should be talking about the finance sector and c- the banking crisis. That should be an, an election issue this year. I'll tell you, no one fucking cares. And that's crazy. I don't know. I guess I just wanted to record us on this because I am disappointed because I, I feel like there was a moment that could have been capitalized and things could have changed, even if only a little bit. And we missed it. Yeah. The last thing I kind of want to add to my previous rant about like the nature of the public private partnership in banking and the state's role in it is that like the state ends up kind of borrowing bank capacity to fulfill certain functions, right? Like financial monitoring of criminals is primarily like initially done by banks, filing SARS and things like that, reporting likely structuring and things like that. There aren't enough government investigators to be like, investigating most of that kind of stuff. And so they rely on banks for that. And then we saw during Trump's administration, I'm thinking of like the PPP loans and the CARES Act payments and things like that. A lot of the administrative and managerial expectations for those were shifted onto the banks instead of the state. And so there was kind of like this, and even in like 2008 or 2009, the great financial crisis, like it's the, the government needed enough of these banks to exist in order to inject the liquidity because you needed someone to take the liquidity and go buy the things in the market, right? And so the banks were fulfilling that role. I get nervous whenever the state capacity depends on private entities and the private entities end up starting to become powerful enough that they have significant influence over the state, right? And that relationship can become deeply problematic. And this gets into many of our rants about regulation in general and the revolving door. And I think banking regulation is like one of the ones that's been most stricken by that over its history, where the people regulating the banks have most commonly come from the banks and often go back to the banks. Yeah. And this is at like the end to be to be fair. Also, this is like an issue with a lot of regulatory bodies 
in general. Yeah. We've talked about this with like with like the SEC. Even if we get into the history of the SEC, it's like at the beginning, I can see how having Joe Kennedy and a host of other big wigs come in and say like, "We're here to protect you, citizenry." I could see how that could work in like 1934 or whatever. You know what I mean? Like maybe I get it, but now the way that they operate and what they provide for the public at large, like it's pretty difficult to suggest I, I would imagine the public that cares about the SEC is probably d disapproving of the job they're doing. And most of, the, most of them don't even care about the SEC as a government entity because it, littles so, it, like, it matters so little to them in their everyday life. And either way, that's kind of like not the best, like for, especially if your job is to patrol markets, like that isn't the best reputation. See, and it's funny to me that you mentioned Joe Kennedy and the founding of the SEC there, because you can even kind of pitch that moment or imagine that moment as like, they didn't want any more Bakura investigations or similar, right? They didn't want their names being dragged in front of Congress every week and every reporter like printing all these documents that showed these deals and whatever. And so by having a regulator in charge of it, an entity they can like exert influence over, over time, you can make sure that that kind of thing isn't in the congressional record every week, you know? And I think this really brings us to our final point, which is obviously there is a solution to this and it's Cascoin. Um, Cascoin, after the multiple bankruptcies and um, business failures and uh fraud charges and settlements. We're here to stay. And I do have ideas that I think a lot of politicians are willing to hear me out on. I know that a lot of, I, you know what? I know a lot of um, big names own Cascoin in general. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, uh, but credible sources have told me. Credible the sources have told me finance. there's only 40 Cascoin left on over-the-counter <laughs> trading desks. <laughs>